think we are ready now for uh, the third lecture by Sriram on no reciprocity and chirality in active matter. Thanks a lot for staying till the bitter, bitter, well, hopefully not very bitter end. Um, I'll, be, I'll be free soon and you guys will be free too. So I thought for the third talk, I'd tell you about this class of problems. Uh, Somewhat strangely, the last two talks, <laughs> hey, <laughs> strangely, the last two talks um, discuss things somewhat related to what I'm going to talk about, but there's a difference, uh, and so it, there will be a small amount of repetition, but uh, bear with me anyway. All right, um, I'll tell you a little bit about non reciprocal interactions, and then I'll cover different kinds of non-reciprocality in uh, two different parts, and then I'll summarize briefly. Uh, and I don't think by any means I'll keep you here for an hour and a half. Okay, and you know, it's, at this point, it's a bit late to even talk so much about non-reciprocal interactions. Clearly, uh, social interactions are non-reciprocal, and really not only sort of interactions at the scale of uh, uh, predator, prey, or pursuit and capture, but even really Sensing, signaling, ligand receptor interactions are fundamentally non-reciprocal because they are not simply about something binding to something, but something binding to something and setting off a signaling cascade. So the thing that comes in and gets bound by the other thing, their behaviors are very different. So non-reciprocal physics somehow is intimately implicated in, uh, in di you know, the directional transfer of signals. And of course, as you know, as you well, no, and as I'll sort of reiterate, uh, even if you don't start, even if you're not just talking about a pair of objects interacting in complete isolation, uh, systems with detailed balance always have uh, interactions governed by an effective energy function, and therefore uh, Newton's third law operating between the, op the effective degrees of freedom. So I'll talk about two kinds of non-reciprocality. There's so much has gone on in this area that I just somewhat casually assembled a few of the pieces of work which uh, discuss this problem. Okay, so uh, one thing I wanted to mention is, supposing you just had a system described by a bunch of microstates labeled by A, B, et cetera. And uh, let's say those microstates themselves, uh, that, that description in terms of microstates is, um, is the, is the uh, you know, the microstates are uh, coordinate-like objects. So their time reversal properties are unimportant. Okay. And so if you have a dynamics uh, governed by a master equation, where the WABs are the transition probabilities, uh, you know, determined by the system plus the environment, then you know that if your system is, you know, in a time, time reversal invariant state, then you can ask for a, I mean, okay. You, you can, let me put it this way, you, somebody gives you a master equation, you can ask, is there a stationary state in which the current on every little tube connecting these microstates in this abstract space, and the current is zero, and then, of course, what that means is the probability that you're here times the transition probability that you go from here to here is the same as the probability that you're here times the transition probability that you go from here to there, that is to say, P1, S, W1, 2 is P1, P2, S, W2, 1, where P, S is the steady state. Now, the point is, if somebody gives you a general master equation, again, I'm talking to the non-experts in the room, if somebody gives you a general evolution equation for probabilities of this form, you can ask for such a steady state, but you may find that you can't have one. Because for this picture to be consistent, it has to be, the, the, you can't have, have this, unless a certain condition is satisfied. And a little reflection will tell you that if you pick any sequence, one, two, three, or any number, then this has to hold for the transition probabilities. In other words, the existence of a detail balanced steady state um, is either allowed or ruled out by a property of the transition probabilities that do not depend on the form of the steady state itself, okay? And uh, if you have this property, then you can you, then you will get a steady state that has this property, and you can build that steady state by arbitrarily picking one of the microstates, labeling it with a probability little p, let's say, 
then you can say the next one will have by, by this rule, the next one will have this probability, the third guy will have this probability, and this condition guarantees that no matter how you do that assignment, it's like a curl-free condition. You, it guarantees that you'll be able to build the steady state by this elementary process locally just by following a nose, okay? And if you can do that, what it means is that the ratio of WAB to WBA for any pair B and A is, the, is governed by the difference of a property assigned purely to B and that same property assigned purely to A. So in that sense, in configuration space, your velocity somehow is downhill along gradients uh, uh, of U. And why am I maundering on about this? It's to say that even if you didn't know there was some kind of an energy function underlying the dynamics, if somebody gives you uh, a master equation uh, with this uh, curl condition satisfied, uh, then that energy function jumps out at you at the end of the analysis. And in effect, all your motions are governed by that energy function. And so if you now sort of somewhat liberally allow me to jump from that picture to a picture of the dynamics of particles with positions x, the particle ij label the particles, and the particles have positions xi, et cetera, uh, then you will end up getting an equation of motion of this form uh, with a damping and a noise and forces coming from an energy function. And therefore, if you take two particles, i and j, the force on i due to j will be, you know, once, once you have this, the force on i due to j is minus the force on j due to i. And this kind of dynamics, the point is, if this is all that's going on in a bunch of objects, you, you can't get what one can think of as directional transmission of information. And the reason I'm going through that is just to say that, in general, therefore, if you are in a system in which detail balance is broken, then you can hope for dynamics that's generically non-reciprocal. Uh, I claim that such systems allow directional transmission of information. And but in this context, therefore, interactions become non-reciprocal in the sense that, for example, if you have two entities, I and J, uh, these forces don't cancel in this manner. Um, now, when we talk about non-reciprocality, you can have different kinds. You, you know, to say that the interaction between something and something else is non-reciprocal requires some kind of identity, identity either by species or by distinguished locations or some internal state variable. Um, in that context, uh, uh, as Shubrato's talk will have told you, uh, Jaijit Das, Madan Rao, and I studied rather early on before the subject had the name non-reciprocality uh, on a non-reciprocal Heisenberg magnet that uh, Subrata told you about today. Okay, uh, I want to, that's the sort of general and somewhat uh, disorderly introduction to non-reciprocality. I want to invoke non-reciprocality in a specific context uh, in which um, there aren't uh, distinct species involved, but you have a bunch of agents labeled by I. You can think of these agents as rotors on a lattice. So let us say PI is the orientation of the agent sitting at lattice site I. SI is the spin angular momentum of that agent. So you've got these things, they can point like this, and they can turn. And I want to write down a general sort of uh, you know, rotational dynamics of these guys. So, and let's say the system is endowed with uh, an inertia parameter. Okay, and where I'm going, you will see with this. At the moment, just think of it as a simple mechanical model that I'm proposing for you. So if I, if this guy, if the, if agent I has an, a spin angular momentum SI about its center of mass, then the orientation evolves in this way where chi is some inertia parameter. If agent I feels a torque due to its neighbors, it'll turn. And let's say the torque, I design the torque to be that each guy interacts, the ith guy interacts with the jth guy through a coupling strength Jij. Okay, so this is an aligning talk, because this says that Pi and Pj like to be parallel. You can think of different models of Jij. One is you can just say this is on some abstract network, some adjacency matrix, and so the ith guy feels a torque due to J of the form Pi cross Jij Pj. Uh, 
Uh, or you can think of the JIJs as being local in space. There's something here, something here, something here. That's the case I will look at. But I will look at a case where the JIJs are local in space. However, uh, I want to build into this model the idea that if something is pointing a certain way, it's sort of got eyes that are pointing largely forward. So um, the eighth guy uh, feels a different interact. So here's two objects, two agents or two birds. Each has a vision cone. So these things can see stuff in front and not see so well beyond uh, some angle. And if you put in an interaction, therefore, that cares, that, that makes JIJ different from JJI because of this vision cone interaction, then immediately you have a torque that isn't governed by an energy function. And the reason is if JIJ is not symmetric, the energy couldn't have come from pi dot jij pj, because that would only pull out the symmetric part of jij. Okay? Now, this seems like a completely arbitrary thing to do. One way of viewing it is that actually these are objects that are engaging in some kind of signaling to each other. And the, if you know, something that's in a position to receive a signal from somewhere isn't the same as the other, you know, if you have two objects which somehow have detectors of some sort on one side, and their response and movement is based on the signal they receive, then this kind of interaction is very natural. And it happens, it's not governed by an energy function, because you could never get a non-symmetric JIJ to do that. What's maybe more amusing, I don't, I'm not sure which side is better to stand on. My neck is hurting. Uh, yeah, this is probably better. Um, let's, so let's write down a specific form for JIJ. Let's say this is site I, that's site J, that's position RI, position RJ. And let's say the JIJ is a constant J for each pair in the neighborhood, plus a correct a piece with a coefficient script A that depends on the angle between the ith guy and the vector from I to J. Okay? And let's put the whole thing on a lattice. So then you can see that basically uh, the biggest that J can, uh, this combination can be is J plus A, and the smallest it can be is J minus A. Um, we started looking at this model essentially because this, well, you will see. Okay. So let, now, right now, just imagine that we're just playing a little game. Let's take this model and let's pass to the continuum limit. The first worry that struck us is that unlike in, um, sort of simple XY or Heisenberg models, we're contracting the order parameter vector with lattice directions. So in principle, it looks like we are introducing, for example, if you take this, four, four, this square lattice picture, we're introducing an interaction saying that this order parameter knows this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction as equivalent, but uh, it actually knows about those four directions. So it looks like you're introducing a fourfold rotational and isotropy. So on the face of it, you might imagine uh, that because you're contracting the order parameter with lattice directions, uh, that you're going to somehow spoil isotropy, and that the effective dynamics of this model will have only the rotation symmetry of the lattice and not the rotation symmetry of the original order parameter space. Right? So let's first check that that's not the case. Because we want to study, what we want to do is to study a non-reciprocal XY model, but we want to retain full XY rotation invariance. We want to retain full O2 invariance. And this rule seems to have kind of spoiled it. Okay? So let's see. Because if it's, once you introduce fourfold anisotropy, it's just a four state clock model. And not so interesting. Yes. Yeah, use a mic so that your voice is recorded for posterity. Mic's not on. Uh, one can distinguish. Yeah. What about left and right? Here so you don't have that. Left and right to be the same. To be the same, right? Yeah. So okay. you, you could do all kinds of things, right? I, mean, but I see. But the idea here we're just trying to say that you, you have objects which have some, you know, which send and receive signals is what you're thinking about. It could be visual or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're not introducing left right asymmetry. Okay. It's not a chiral model. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but you know, you can then just. Take the uh, uh, non-symmetric part of the of the torque. So 
PI, the torque is PI cross JIJ PJ summed over J. JIJ in turn has this piece which is potentially non-symmetric. Just take it, expand it out. There's a P dot R times P cross P. Just, and this Rij vector is summed over these four vectors. So what you will end up getting, you know, you can write PJ. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm to write, trying to write the continuum theory by saying that P at site J, I can think of as P at site I plus a little vector. And I'll write that as P at site I plus E. I mean, this is sort of a barbaric notation because these are sitting on discrete sites. But I'm pretending that I'm taking a smooth picture and the P at site J is P at site I plus a lattice vector dot gradient of P plus higher orders, okay? So when I do this, I'll take this object, put it in here, this is PJ, right? And expand it out. And what I'll end up doing is summing over neighbors E alpha tensor E alpha. And that's a basis set, a set of basis vectors for the lattice. So this object becomes the unit matrix. You can develop this to succeeding orders in gradient expansion. It turns out even at diffusion order, you're still isotropic. If you go to three orders in gradients, you start to see uh, lattice features. So even though the order parameter engages with the discrete symmetries of the lattice, the long wavelength theory is uh, rotation invariant. It's a little different from the usual thing you do. You've got some fields, and normally you'll, you know, you'll discretize your gradient operators, but typically uh, this is sort of a slightly weirder feature, but rather nice, that it turns out that even on a square lattice, uh, this model uh, doesn't require your somehow roughening or melting the lattice in order to get this correct continuum picture, which is what uh, initially when we were playing this, we had thought and John Turner also thought at some point. So there is an argument, anyway, so that's maybe why it's interesting. So there's no, there's no lattice details up to Laplacian order, okay? So what does that mean? What that means is that this dynamics, when taken to the continuum limit, becomes, this is, the, this is the continuum equation for, sort of the kinematic equation for P in terms of the spin angular momentum S, and this is the mechanical equation for torques on the spin angular momentum S, and you'll get one piece which comes from the uh, symmetric isotropic part of J, and the other from that funny anti-symmetric piece, okay? So you end, up, you end up getting this combined dynamics. In particular, it means you get terms at first order in gradients in this dynamical equation. Uh, I didn't mention when I presented the equations earlier, but in principle, because you've got these spins, you know, in an environment, there's no particular conservation law, there's no particular reason unless you impose it to have a conservation law for S. If Jij had been symmetric, then in the absence of this damping, the sum over all the I's, Si, would have been conserved, and that this would really have then become related to model G. That must have that must have been uh, Andrea, but I can't see him. Yeah. It is <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's we can do two things with this model. One is we can say that we look at this equation and say that. By the way, note that this term it turns out doesn't conserve S. Okay, and therefore we might as well introduce a damping because it's allowed. S is now a fast variable, and it's not really model G anymore. You can eliminate S, solve for S in terms of these guys. So if you solve for S in terms of these guys in a sort of you know, dumb way by throwing away S and just saying that on time scales big compared to chi over eta, S is slaved to these guys, which are the true slow variables of the problem, then you get an effective equation of motion on time scales long compared to chi over eta, which is P dot has a del squared P piece, and a p dot grad p piece. This projector perpendicular to p is because I'm sort of uh, insisting on p being a unit vector, but that's unimportant. I can soften that and say that p is a soft spin with a length that, with a preferred length rather than a fixed length. So why is this equation interesting? This equation is interesting because p advects itself, okay? So what is happening here is P dot, a term like p dot grad p, you normally think of as how a velocity field carries itself in the Navier-Stokes equation. That self-advecting property emerges here even though nobody is going anywhere. Only information is going, okay? 
we're sitting on a lattice, and so you have an advective nonlinearity for an orientation field on a lattice. It's funny, A, because nobody's going anywhere in its advection, and B, because normally when you have that, the variable concerned is a velocity-like variable. This variable is just an orientation. It's even under time reversal. Yet, in this active problem, it, it acquires this funny property. Okay? So what that means is that the sort of, uh, and by the way, now if you take this equation and add non-conserving noise, you can ask what kind of phases can this guy have? And at low enough noise, it should have a phase with true long range order. Modulo a certain paper, recent paper, uh, which I will come to by Bess, Chate, and Solon, which I will discuss later. All right? So um, that's part one of the story. So what's, what's happening is that non-reciprocality is not something that you have to invoke by introducing two components and so forth. You can have different kinds of non-reciprocality. Here it's non-reciprocality having to do with which way something is pointing, the, the, where someone's receptors are situated, okay? And that very non-reciprocality is responsible for the interaction that stabilizes long-range order uh, in the Toner 2 model. So this is the Toner 2 equation without a density field, uh, annoyingly called the Manthusian Toner 2 model by John. Um, all right, so that's kind of fun. So this says that if you study this lattice XY model with noise, uh, you'll get long range order uh, plus some other features. The other fun thing you can do with this model is just you take this as a dynamical model with rotational inertia and uh, alignment and study it. Uh, if you, you can do the elimination of S a little bit more systematically. Really what you have is you have a short time in the problem which is chi over eta. And so you develop this, eliminate systematic S systematically by expanding in powers of one over eta. Okay, am I doing it right? Yeah, one over eta, right. And so when you do that, the effective equation of motion, so get a set of equations, now you've got, consider a system aligned in some direction and look at the dynamics of transverse fluctuations about that direction, then the effective equations of motion for the angular fluctuations for the broken symmetry mode uh, get a correction due to this mode elimination at second order in gradients, which if the uh, asymmetric interaction is strong enough, actually leads to a diffusive instability in the Toner 2 equation. The instability criterion is basically that the long wavelength Kinematic, the short, the, am I doing it right? The long wavelength, uh, sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, kinematic wave speed, I guess, is, I'm doing this all, my words are not right. I mean, the, yeah, the kinematic wave speed is large compared to the turning wave speed. Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying it right. So this is a kinematic wave. This, in the theory where you keep inertia, would have been a turning wave speed, okay? So, Basically, if you work at short wavelengths, you will get, if the uh, antisymmetric part of the interaction is strong enough, you will get a growing mode, which in this wave number regime is uh, independent of wave number. You have growing mode independent of wave number, which travels along. The, the unstable disturb the, for A greater than zero, if you go back and look at the equations, a given bird sees its forward neighbor better and the unstable disturbance travels to the rear, which makes sense, okay? And the, there's a threshold for the instability, which you can write in this form. Um, if you look at all regimes, in the long, completely long wavelength limit, we have an effective toner to equation. Uh, if the antisymmetric interaction is strong enough, you have a diffusive instability. At short wavelengths, you have a wave number independent instability, and there is potentially an interesting regime in between where you have a growth rate that goes as the square root of wave number. Uh, so this class of problems is something we're studying uh, currently. Pankaj Popli, who's a postdoc with us, and Ananya are studying this problem uh, numerically. And you get, so it's like looking at a dynamics. It's like taking model G, ruining the conservation of the third component of the spin, uh, and allowing non-symmetric interactions. Uh, and looking at the kinds of turbulent states that emerge. And there's sort of, there's an interesting zoology of those states which we're trying to make sense of, okay? So that's work in progress. Uh, the other part of the story is, uh, 
about to the long range x y order okay um, you know already that this equation with noise studied as a PDE uh, has been shown by Toner and two uh, and numerically studied by these guys and shown modulo a certain interesting issue to have long range order in two dimensions what that means is if you measure the uh, rotor rotor orientation correlation function then there should be a phase in which that correlation function at large distances goes to a non-zero value and indeed if the antisymmetry is non-zero it does that for comparison these are the curves you get at these various temperatures if uh, the uh, non-reciprocal interaction is set to zero so non-reciprocality uh, indeed leads lead to a uh, long range 2D XY order. However, as these folks remarked, specifically in the context of this PDE, this order is metastable. Uh, what that means is that this picture is incomplete. If you wait long enough, somehow aster defects and their and, and anti-asters get spontaneously nucleated and the whole system collapses into a paroxysm of uh, kind of vortex turbulence, okay? Uh, there are various ways of trying to understand that, and there are some points about it certainly made in this fantastic paper. We thought we would take a sort of very elementary point of view on it. If you look at this equation, so we're st restricting ourselves to studying the original XY model itself, okay? We're studying it uh, purely in the uh, limit in which the uh, meaning with no inertia studying this one right now with noise but not I'm sorry not the PDE I'm not saying this right um, we're just studying the non reciprocal XY model that results from eliminating uh, uh, S okay all right um, but if you look at the PDE, you note that this ratio, J over A, is a length scale. In other words, an equation with just a del squared P and an equation with P dot grad P and del squared P have an important difference in that this equation has a length scale above which for a generic direction of P, this term should somehow dominate over this because it has one less grad than this one. That length scale is J over A. So, is it the case that if I put in, if by some means I introduce a plus half, a plus one and a minus one defect into the system, is there some sense in which they don't see each other beyond the scale J over A? Is that really what's happening? Leaving aside the question of how you might get two defects somewhat far apart in the system, is there some rough and ready way in which we can understand uh, the possibility that defects are screened? Now, this should remind you, I don't know, maybe I say it here, yeah. You remember in my, I don't know, my first lecture or something, I, I talked about uh, how one motile object moving through an elastic medium uh, ha produces a displacement field that's governed not only by the elasticity of the medium, but by its motility, and that introduced a length scale. You had a comparison between a V dot grad and an elasticity times del squared. Uh, this is very similar, your comparison, comparison between a P dot grad something and a del squared. So this is that same kind of idea that you've got something. So imagine you had an ordered state with everybody pointing in one direction and you put in two defects, let us say, forward and backward. Um, then, um, you know, is it the case that somehow the fact that you've got a background ordered state um, screens one of them from the other? Does that physics somehow arise in this problem? So we decided to check it in a very, we just decided to take the lattice model. We, you know, we decided, but Pankaj did it. So we take the lattice model and put in plus one, minus one uh, vortex pairs, aster, pair, uh, aster anti aster, um, and see what happens. Okay. So in all of these, uh, the order parameter is pointing, the background order parameter far away is pointing that way, is pointing to the right, okay? Uh, there is a plus aster at the center and minus asters started at various 
locations. So this, is, this represents a collection of studies, each of which only has a plus aster and a minus aster, okay? Plus aster at the center, and so this is for the ordinary XY model, and all that happens is these guys come in and annihilate, okay? This is when you switch on a, a reasonably large value of the uh, asymmetric or non-reciprocal interaction. Okay? And uh, here is what happens. By the way, it's important to note that the way I've written the equations, an order parameter pointing that way means the advection velocity is that way because it's a plus a p dot grad p on the right-hand side of the equation. I think I've got that right. So you can see that, so I don't know, let's start this again. So this funny arc-like, the, 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 this is a plus half and a, a plus, this is a plus and a minus. The minus is here, the plus is here. And you see this sort of stretching out of the effects of the minus onto uh, an arc, but, the, but absolutely no sign of them annihilating each other. Okay. You can consider starting them out not, you know, wait, I think I've, uh, I've, I've included the wrong file, I think. Oh, I, I, the, I have to slow it down. Ah, I forgot, yeah, excuse me. So you, there must be a way of slowing this down. So you can see that even if you started out off center, it quickly goes to this position and just hangs about there and refuses to annihilate. On the other hand, if you have the, for this sign of parameters, if you have the minus on the left and the plus on the right, they quickly see each other and annihilate. Okay. And whereas for the ordinary XY, nothing like that happens. Okay. So something interesting is going on that you put in, you seed two topological defects, and the, in the presence of the um, non-reciprocal interaction, they actually resolutely refuse to annihilate. So you can somehow imagine that if noise produces a bunch of defects, that a few of them will doggedly survive till the end. And then the advection term smears the, the fields of the minus half and produces this sort of arc. And that place further generates, this mechanism is described in Bess et al. But here the point is basically we don't, we don't do anything but put in a pair of defects. And those guys just, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Ah, it is. Oh, okay. Mm. Right. Um, so then you can do a sort of set of trials, okay? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'll tell you there's something, I'll, I'll talk about distance here. Yeah. So um, what you can do is you can say, you know, as a function of initial separation, always along the polarization direction in this case, uh, you can ask for different values of A, you know, how long do these guys take to rebind? And this color code is how long they take to rebind. And at least purely empirically, there seems to be a boundary between where they rebind and where they don't. And the smaller A is, the larger the initial separation before they don't rebind, no, before they rebind, the larger initial separation before they rebind. And there seems to be a boundary above which to the you know, extent that one has weighted, they just don't find each other. Uh, by the way, please note, uh, these, these, are, these are all done with some small amount of noise. It's not as though we haven't uh, allowed uh, random processes to take place. The noise is present. You're in the parameter regime where nominally the system would be ordered if you, if you believed this long range order mechanism for uh, you know, engendered by the self-advection or the non-response. 
there really seems to be a boundary. Uh, and if you like, this is the length scale beyond which they, you know, if you pull them apart by that much, they won't find each other. And you can, you can sort of, you know, replot that. And, you know, to, again, a parent's loving eye, it's a, it is one upon A, roughly speaking. All right, so uh, I won't say anything more about that because those, I actually put those slides in this morning. So you can see that, uh, uh, I, but I think these results are robust. It's just that we haven't written them up yet. And I don't know if you count this as an explanation, but at least it offers something like a mechanism. It says there's a natural length scale in the problem. That length scale, it, it is the non reciprocality or equivalently self advection which is responsible for that length scale. This idea of advection versus diffusion giving you a length scale is something that we know from so many problems. And it looks like that is at work here. All right? And uh, so non reciprocity somehow cloaks inter defect uh, interaction. Okay, so that's the end of the first part of the talk. There's bunches of other things going on in that problem, and with some luck, um, you'll hear about it at some other. Okay, now second part of my talk. So that first part of my talk, as I said, I was a little worried when Shumantra started talking about uh, uh, defects not annihilating. I was also a little worried when Garrett started talking about chiral active matter. I think there is enough in each part of the talk that doesn't overlap seriously with what uh, these other speakers said. In particular, please note, in Shumantra's talk, he didn't have self-advection. He had motility. The concentration, the current of the concentration is proportional to the uh, order parameter. So, uh, you know, maybe there's more than one, there's, as, I guess you can't say these things anymore. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, anyway, there I said it. Um, all right, um, chiral active matter. Uh, Gareth did such a gorgeous job of describing uh, chirality in active matter that I'll just skip this slide. Uh, this is work done with S.J. Gareth and Ananyo. Uh, part of it is on cholesterics and lamellar phases. Uh, part of it is on columnar phases. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time on columnar than on lamellar. So um, one of the uh, sort of We decided to start studying translationally ordered chiral active matter, and we decided to take a very general approach. Rather than writing down what the equations for the displacement field should look like, we just said, look, a translationally ordered system is a, is a system with some kind of composition or uh, density field, which has spontaneously undergone a modulation, maybe thanks to some physics uh, contained uh, in some free energy function. So imagine you have some system, there's some scalar, some field, some scalar field, let's say, psi. And for simplicity, I've written a conservation law form, but you could imagine writing non conserved versions of this as well. And I have an equation for that order parameter field, that composition field, which has a current. That current can consist of advection by a hydrodynamic velocity field, and it can consist of uh, movement down chemical potential gradients, and it can get something from some active processes. The velocity field, or the momentum density of that system, uh, is driven by stresses. Those stresses can come from a free energy functional or from active processes. In this form, if you didn't have anything active, these equations would be called model H. So if you include activity, as we will in the current and the stresses, one calls the, we would like to call this active model H. If, and then, you know, further in the nameology of these things, uh, we're including chirality, so we'll call it active model H star if there's hydrodynamic flow. Active model B star has been studied, which is only a composition variable, no hydrodynamic flow. We want to study translation ordered phases, so we will write down a description in terms of some free energy functional. And that free energy functional has various minima corresponding to different types of translational order. And for today, we will um, uh, restrict ourselves to 
one dimensional and two dimensional translation order, one dimensional in two and three dimensions, and two dimensional in three dimensions. Okay. Um, we could choose psi to be a pseudo scalar and thereby making a system which is chiral only when the average of psi is non zero, or we could choose psi to be a scalar and declare the system as a whole to be chiral. So the chirality can be carried in the parameters in the equation or in the field variable that we're looking at. Today, I think in all that I'm talking about, the chirality will be a background property of the medium in general. So you can think of psi as just a composition field in a system that is overall chiral. Clearly, the, the, the symmetries of those two problems are different. In one, you change the sign of the epsilon tensor and the pseudoscalar field. You go back to the same problem. In the one, the other, you don't. Okay? And we'll uh, write down stresses and uh, currents. But actually, I will not bother seriously about time reversal breaking or active currents. We'll focus on active stresses only. Okay? Right. Um, and now, supposing the system was achiral, okay, and active, then I'm going to write down my stresses not by building it in detail from the di displacement field, but as I said, in terms of the scalar field psi. And the simplest active stress I can write down is something bilinear in gradients of psi with a coefficient which uh, now, by time-honored convention, uh, is a, an off-diagonal kinetic coefficient times a chemical driving force, basically. The chemical, sumo mechanical coupling times the chemical driving force. And if you want to study, let us say, a system with one-dimensional order, you choose a free energy functional uh, and expand that about where that free energy functional has a minimum corresponding to one-dimensional order. Okay? And say you have a density wave, which on average is in the z direction with a wave, vector, wave number, ordering wave number q naught. And Perturbations about that ordered state, we'll only look at the easy perturbations, which are in the phase. We'll treat the amplitude as constant. The phase of that density wave, Q naught times the phase that, the, the phase of that density wave is Q naught times the displacement of Q naught. Okay. Um, again, as I said, using this framework, we can study both uh, smectic and cholesteric systems. But if you do so, either from this point of view or from the more detailed description that Gareth told you about, you will discover that if you only do the equilibrium dynamics of the system, you will find no hydrodynamic distinction between these two phases. But now, if we study this system, if we include achiral stresses and chiral stresses, we will discover, I'm giving away the secret, but Gareth already did, you'll discover an interesting difference between these two phases. So let me restate that. Supposing you just looked at layered systems without chirality. This is the simplest active stress you can write down. And uh, it will turn out that if you, that the long wavelength dynamical description you get for this, for the instabilities of this system and of this system are in a sense essentially the same. However, what those flows do to the structure of this system is more interesting because of the detailed director field structure in, that this system is endowed with. And I'll come to that in a moment, okay? The first point is this. As Gareth already told you, there's no hydrodynamic distinction between these two phases in equilibrium. If they are active, what's the difference? The first studies on that were only including achiral active stresses in a detailed numerical study even of a cholesteric. And those were Carl Whitfield, who's... Uh, Garrett student and a bunch of us. So the idea there is the following. Consider the effect of this stress. If you expand it in this density wave state, what it amounts to, depending on the sign of uh, zeta, is a force density that looks like this. And that for one sign, which sign? Um, if zeta is negative, right? Excuse me? It is, yes, yeah. Thank you. I'm glad somebody's reading. It amounts to a system under tension. The layers will buckle to maintain the spacing. So what's happening here, therefore, is the presence of this active stress 
is doing essentially the same as what you would get by pulling on the system. And this is the famous helfried curo uh, undulation instability. The claim is in cholesterics or in smectics with activity, with achiral activity, you get this undulation instability. Okay, and that has rather pretty effects if you impose it on a cholesteric, and those were discussed some years ago by various of us. Now, let's take, and I, I, I don't have movies, but you get rather spectacular patterns of lambda lines. On, for limited geometries, you actually get interesting ordered modulated structures, and for unbounded geometries, you get a kind of active turbulence. Now, what I want to do next is to build chiral active stresses, okay? So far, we only looked, I only discussed the, the, the form of achiral terms. The simplest chiral active stress I can write down for a system in which psi itself is um, scalar uh, is of this form, epsilon ijk, grad l, grad j psi, grad k psi, okay? With a coefficient which rather complicatedly we've called z sub chi. So what does that do? This term, if expanded in, in this density wave state and expressed in terms of the displacement field, gives you this interesting object. Gareth already talked about this object. U is the displacement field. Del squared U is the local mean curvature. So this term is a force density tangent to contours of constant mean curvature. So if I've got a bump like this, I'll get a forcing on the contours around that bump, okay? And please note the symmetries of this problem. Epsilon ij is the z component of epsilon ijk. Uh, you can ask, how do I know which way to project onto z? The answer is, I can take z to minus z and invert u to minus u, and I'm still, and so it's consistent to choose an arbitrary z direction as long as I treat that as a direction of positive u. So the symmetries of the problem are all right. There isn't a unique 2D epsilon tensor. It depends on which way I call z versus minus z, but it's no problem. The symmetries are right, okay? In two dimensions, you can write down something more interesting. So if you have a 2D chiral active system, the simplest stress you can write down is grad psi times the dual of grad psi, where little epsilon is the 2D antisymmetric tensor. So this is a 2D chiral system. And the, clearly, this guy has the potential to have rather more dramatic effects than this one in some sense. In the sense, it's got fewer gradients, okay? And this term, for example, will lead to a shear strain from dilation or a dilative strain from shear, okay? Uh, you can expand these, you can rewrite these in terms of displacement fields, okay? So let's define a tensor. It's a little bit complicated, W with ZZ component is du over dz, and uh, zperp and perp z components is the in-plane gradient to the displacement field. The stress gets two pieces, one from the achiral active stress and one from the chiral that look like this. The interesting thing about this guy, which is basically this guy, is that, as Gareth already pointed out, you get a force in response to a displacement field in a direction in which there's no broken symmetry, in a fluid direction. So the only thing that resists that force is viscosity, okay? So, um, and here in two dimensions, if you take this object and patiently expand it, uh, you will get, for example, uh, a dilation will lead to a, a shear strain. This two-dimensional phenomenon is sort of Classic odd elasticity, it breaks, again, what Gareth conveniently talked about, namely Maxwell-Betti reciprocity, uh, which is the symmetry of the elastic of, so if you write down a linear relation between stress and strain, then the fourth rank tensor that enters, if it was from an energy function, would of necessity be symmetric on the interchange of ij and kl. But if you just write down a general relation, then for a system not governed by an energy function, this symmetry is broken, and the 2D active stress that we wrote down on these very general grounds is an example of that. The 3D active stress uh, is what we decided to refer to as order than odd elasticity, because it's a force in a direction that doesn't have a displacement. Okay. Um, yes? Yes? 
the PRL didn't let us use the word order than odd elasticity in the title of the paper, but I thought we'd say it here. Um, <coughs> the, the, the instability driven by the 2D active, 2D odd elastic stresses, um, if you imagine a 2D system of stripes uh, made of chiral things, you can sort of imagine them as a bunch of, bunch of rows of little spinners that have organized themselves into a st stack of stripes. So if you've got something spinning this way and the next guy spinning this way, then what will happen? You will get, let's try to draw this. So I've got a bunch of things, let us say, all spinning that way. So you sort of, these things will sort of self-shear in some funny way. And that maybe is what is being seen in this pattern, which represents what happens as the linear instability sets in. We don't know what the final state is, but I suppose 2D and active should be some kind of spiral turbulence or something like that, I would guess. But we don't know. We haven't studied it linearly, numerically. Uh, in 3D, going back to the 3D and this force density that we've grown so fond of, Gareth already showed you this uh, charming picture. What it says is that if the achiral active stresses produce an undulation instability, then the chiral active stresses will produce an alternating array uh, of flow vortices. So clockwise, anticlockwise, clockwise, anticlockwise. The classic undulation instability actually gives you a square lattice. So you can conveniently have an alternating array because the lattice is square without worrying about frustration. Okay. And the other cool thing, as again Gareth mentioned, is that the, even if the undulation instability was spontaneous, you can take the law into your own hands and squeeze this way and suppress the undulation instability. And you will then switch off this, lat this flow vortex lattice. So in principle, it's a tunable or a, at least you have an on-off switch for this uh, lattice, which is kind of fun. <clears throat> right. And at least at this level of analysis, it doesn't really destroy the structure. But I have to admit, this is, not, this is not a numerical simulation of the full PDEs or anything. It's just drawing the flow field resulting from the undulations. Okay. The, you'll calculate the flow field by just putting that force density into the Stokes equation and calculating the flow field. And yeah, so you could worry about u dot. Uh, yeah, probably even, yeah, because the gradients are all radial, so then even the advection term won't affect it. It's probably okay. I just worry sometimes if there's something else. Okay, I think we've got that. Okay, so that was that was lamellar phases. Uh, let's discuss columnar phases again. Several of you have probably heard this talk before, but this this story before. But bear with me anyway. Uh, you can read about this here. Um, so it's sort of a greater potential for interesting things to happen because you have. You've got the column direction whose symmetries you can worry about, and you have the reciprocal lattice of the 2D order. So this is a system. Uh, this is actually a picture from the first paper in which the 2D order in three dimensions is reported uh, at the Raman Institute a few kilometers from here. Hmm? A few kilometers from here. But, you know, not as far as Paris. <clears throat> 15 kilometers from here. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how do you study the system? You go back to our active model H, use a free energy functional that favors 2D order. And, you know, you exp look at a generic free energy functional favoring translational order and look at it in parameter space where you can get 2D order. Um, and uh, as I said, there's sort of more fun and games that you can have here. Uh, so, once you have such a state, it's going to be perturbations about that ordered state, the broken symmetry perturbations, the easy, the soft perturbations are going to be described by a 2D displacement field, a two-dimensional strain field, which we've written here in linearized form, right? So it's columns, this column direction, it's not a bunch of solid rods. This column direction is the fluid direction. What it means is that 
the system can flow in that direction. What that means is you can shear the columns past each other paying only a viscous cost. In the plane perpendicular to this system, there's a shear modulus. Okay. Right. And one of the, the a chiral active stress, which you will construct in exactly the same way and then expand about the ordered phase, you will find gives you a term of this sort. Um, the important part of which is two z derivatives on u perm. Okay, so what it means in particular is that you get a restoring force at second order in gradients to bending of the columns. Uh, depending on the sign of activity, that restoring force can either uh, give you a tension or a negative tension for the columns. A negative tension for the columns will mean that you get an undulation instability of the columns, rather like taking the columnar phase and dilating it by hand. In other words, depending on this, uh, you know, for the, if zeta is less than zero, I hope with this sign, you get an instability. If zeta is greater than zero, you get an active stabilization of the columns. So this is the helfrich hero instability for the columnar phase. It's an instability under uh, uh, deviatoric stress that's isotropic in the plane perpendicular to the columns, strictly speaking. Okay. And you will get a spontaneous buckling of the columns and all those things. So that's sort of uh, known physics in some sense. And you can, of course, compete with that by embracing the columns and pushing them together. Okay. All right. um, the simplest chiral force density you can write down in terms of the psi field, I already showed you the expression. G expressed here in terms of the displacement field, it's that chiral coupling times the curl of del squared u perp. So this is the columnar analog of that term that I already showed you. This is the force density, okay? So it's the same idea, it's the dual of del squared u perp, okay? So, but it's more complicated to visualize its effect here because what you have is columns, you don't have a bump and circulate around that. You, you got uh, the flow will affect a mixture of liquid and solid directions. But these are flows that will lead to twist of the columns. And so what that means is, if you've got a section of a uh, column that's tilted like this, you'll get flows like that. If you've got a curvature like this, you'll get flows like that or like that, depending on the sign of the coupling. <clears throat> now, supposing your system was not only 2D ordered and columnar, but it had a difference between that, it knew the difference between up and down along the columns. So it had a polarity along the columns. That's not crazy, actually, uh, if you look at the axon, uh, the microtubule bundles there have a net polarity. So it's not a completely daft thing to look at. If you have such a term, then it turns out you can write down a force density, which I guess I have not written down in terms of the psi field. Oh, well, that's all right. Okay. In order to do this, however, you need to have an additional variable in the problem, namely the polarization. If you work only in terms of the composition or density field psi, you can't build this object because you can't magically construct an independent vector out of these. Because if you try to build that vector out of gradients of psi, all of those guys will act in the plane. So you need, you have to endow yourself with a polarity along the columns. But if you give me that, then I can give you a force density that looks like this. And this is cool, because what it says is that I'll have a force density which is proportional to two derivatives of the displacement, but dual to it. So what does that mean? That's classic odd elasticity, right? It's del squared with displacement, but with a 2D epsilon tensor on it. And you need this 3D system to have it, okay? If you write down the dynamics of such a system with this polar chiral active coupling, what you have is a balance between, in ignoring inertia, you have a balance between, in, you know, displacements perpendicular to the columns and velocity perpendicular to the columns. So you have a dynamics in which the powers of wave number drop out. So you'll get, you know, if basically if you replace the velocity field by the rate of change of the displacement field, you will get that u dot is a single time scale times u, but with an epsilon, right? And so what that means is that you're going to get that you know, ux dot is uh, that whole coefficient. 
sorry, my notation is horrible. I've called the viscosity mu and I've called the chemical potential mu. Okay, so try divided by viscosity. Okay, times So what that means is that ux and uy act like position and momentum, even though they're both actually displacement types of variables. And you have oscillations. Yes? Thank you. Yeah. You're paying attention. I, if I was really clever, I'd say I put that there to check if you were paying attention. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah, of course, that's what I did. Right. Right. So this is, this is quite cool because it's, you know, it's like, so there are several things that work here. One, the fact that all powers of wave number drop out is because of the long range nature, nature of the stroke of the of Stokes hydrodynamics. So, you know, all force densities in Stokes hydrodynamics have, a, have features rather similar to, to, to um, electrostatics. Uh, the other is uh, activity in a chiral system, which allows this, this 3D system to mimic 2D uh, odd elasticity. Okay. You can work out the speed and the damp, the, I'm not this, the frequency and the damping, this. Uh, the 3D character is important. Actually, if you look at the details of this, you, the, this mode frequency vanishes if you work it out in detail for perturbations purely in the XY plane or purely along Z. So 2D odd gel won't have this mode, okay? And you, the, the, the form of the mode will look like this, and the, the oscillation frequency of this mode will look like this. Um, and even order, uh, you can write down a full three-dimensional viscosity tensor, including odd bits, if you are chiral, polar, and active, you can certainly have a three-dimensional odd viscosity tensor and three-dimensional non-chiral active stresses, for example. That interplay will give you something slightly different. That odd, that viscosity tensor, it turns out, Ananyo thought of it, but then it turns out it has already been discussed by Vincenzo. And when? Like, like last month or something, is it? Yeah, something like that. Anyway, which is fine. Okay, so the interplay of 3D odd, uh, 3D polar odd viscosity and sort of uh, regular uh, elasticity gives you a slightly more complicated mode structure with oscillations even for perturbations purely along Z. That's, it's a little difficult to swallow this at the end of the third lecture. Uh, but, you know, with some luck, somebody will actually conjure up a nice experimental system on which some of this at least uh, can be explored. Maybe the best hope is lamellar and columnar phases in which, you know, biocompatible phases in which bacteria are released or something like that. Uh, I don't know whether the physics of, whether physics of this sort is obtained within the axon, but it's tempting to think it is. Okay. And uh, as promised, I finished well before uh, 5.30. Uh, so here I have sort of multiple summaries. One is what I just told you about, that this sort of disappointing fact that chirality is not, can not only be present in uh, ordered structures, but not reveal its presence in the mechanics, it can sometimes even be responsible for the very existence of those ordered structures, like cholesterics, and yet not manifest itself in the mechanics at thermal equilibrium. It turns out that if you introduce activity, all of a sudden, the simple fact that, in a sense, as Pierre Curie, Curie told us, uh, you know, if you have an asymmetry, you can't rule out a current consistent with that asymmetry, is what allows you in active systems to acquire currents. Remember, currents are time reversal breaking objects, to acquire currents that are non-zero in the presence of those asymmetries. So chirality plus activity breaks symmetries unbreakable in equilibrium matter. And in general, spatial asymmetries plus activity gives you greater freedom 
to transform the dynamics because you're liberated from time reversal invariance. Right? I mean, this is roughly the message of the kind of whatever is not explicitly forbidden is allowed approach that we have taken to active hydrodynamics. Uh, going back to the earlier part of today's talk, we talked about how the self-advection of the order parameter, rather than being viewed as a result of something being a velocity field, can be usefully understood as just the consequence of non-reciprocal interactions based on some kind of sensing and signaling picture, whether it's vision or whatever it is. And uh, so you get self-advection of the order parameter, and you get, in a sense, flocking without moving, if you want to call it that. And the same term that seems to stabilize xy order, uh, we already have learned from the work of Bess et al, creates an astral eruption. And I've given you at least a, a rationalization based on an empirical approach, put down uh, topological defects and see what they do to each other. More generally, since these were supposed to be three exhausting and exhaustive lectures on active hydrodynamics, uh, let's, um, you know, what have we learned from all of this? First of all, we've understood that uh, what we learned at our mother's knee um, can be used even in systems to which we didn't think they could apply, you know? Systems systematically driven away from equilibrium at the level of the individual components. Once you take a liberal view to how you write down those equations. Don't start from a free energy function. So all kinds of interesting instabilities, non-reciprocal dynamics, weird chiral effects, and uh, you know, of possible relevance not only to living matter and artificial matter in general, but maybe, maybe even uh, of some interest uh, in problems like sensing, signaling, and so forth. There's lots and lots of questions that uh, you can ask. Uh, and some of, the, I mean, all of these in various forms are being asked in the current literature, so they can't really be viewed as an agenda for the future, but maybe they're an agenda for the near future based on what all of us are thinking about. Many of us, I think, are thinking about questions like this. You can have an active system, but if that activity is somehow bound up in some very local, boring physics, the macro physics might not show signs of it, right? If you just got a bunch of little beads vibrating around a little bit, you know, maybe you won't see the effects of activity. That's not very different from saying if you've got a layer of fluid heated from below and the layer is sufficiently thin or the temperature gradient is sufficiently small, it's not very different from a layer of fluid not being with a heat, without a heat current. Even before convection starts, it's a time reversal non-invariant system, but it might not show macroscopic manifestations of it. So more generally, small scale broken time reversal invariant might not blossom into something interesting at large scale unless you drive it hard enough. So it's nice to understand when it does, when it doesn't, whether there are ways of probing this. And there are, you know, many, there's already a large literature on this subject. Um, so far, we've taken the point of view that we know how to choose variables, right? We just said, look, you know, Martin Parodi and Pashan or whatever it is, taught us how to figure out what the slow variables are. We'll just change the kinds of dynamical terms that can arise in their equations of motion. Is that all? Do we really know that matter that's evolved over billions of years to its present form isn't somehow, hasn't somehow settled down into some very non-generic point? We, I mean, again, you know that, you know, we are not generic objects, right? Uh, and you know that proteins aren't generic heteropolymers. And you know that, you know, you, you know this in many, many ways. The question is, can you extract any new principle from any of what we've learned? But other ways of viewing slow vari variables in living matter. I mean, I know there's been many suggestions that such systems have been selected to self-adjust to a critical point. As I understand it, bird flocks seem to have a dynamics in which even the amplitude of the order parameter uh, is critical. I don't know. Um, an interesting class of directions, uh, for, again, for the near future, could be trying to understand models of driven, driven quantum matter with an active, from an, with, you know, active matter glasses, in some sense. Uh, and there is already beginning to be a literature on this subject. Um, anyway, uh, this, is, this was the last thing I added to my uh, uh, talk when I said I had to edit it. So with that, I thank you for your attention and patience, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any.
Is the Bob Dylan quote right? Yes, yes. Thank you, Sri Ram, for seeing these beautiful lectures. Are there more questions? Everybody is scrolling. This, uh, if you are making front and back different, front and back different, then it's uh, creating long range order in polar. But suppose I make longitudinal order, then it doesn't. No, as then, far as we know, it uh, doesn't, right? Because polar, that's just that, that's just the pneumatic. The kinds of nonlinearities needed to produce long range order uh, don't arise in active pneumatics. Right? We, can sort of no, study but them. May not be long range, but some some result of active pneumatics. But that's uh, essentially the reason. All the novel properties of active pneumatics are precisely related to this difference between a long and transverse movement. So they are in fact coming from that. However, uh, long range order isn't one long of them. Order. Alas, yeah. Uh, it can of course turn out that a system that was purely pneumatic and had defects condenses into a polar ordered phase as. Courage, Christina, and so forth have shown. Okay, that can. But then, what's happened is you've become is become a vector ordered phase. Yeah. It's not a pneumatic that's, anymore. That's right. That's that kind of thing can happen. So, symmetry breaking can produce oddball phases of different kinds. Jacques had some question. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you should give him a mic. It's it's not really a question. It's just just a simple <laughs> remark. Uh, um, indeed, it's it's hard to make a difference. And large scale between a cholesteric and asthmatic, but if you turn on a temperature gradient, yes, you can. Yes, absolutely. And absolutely. this is called the Lehman effect. Indeed, indeed. And the yeah, Lehman effect, yeah. if you like, yeah. is making a cholesteric into an active cholesteric. That's right. Because you're driving it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and of yeah. course, fantastic but, rotation happens. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So in a sense, this, in a lot of ways, there's nothing that new about active liquid crystals that you don't have in some form you know, some of the EHD in electrohydrodynamic instabilities are rather like the instabilities of, and this is something we also remarked back in the early days of this game. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I tried to explain it experimentally. Ah, I see. Yeah. I didn't succeed. <laughs> Related to Jacques' question, yeah. I mean, if you put uh, boundaries, yeah. then uh, you should be able to mechanically tell the difference between a chiral Correct. I mean, I think the point is that, uh, you know, many things at finite scale can tell the difference. The asymptotic long wavelength dynamics can't. That's also true. But do you know what happens to this active chiral? So we, we haven't looked, uh, thought very much about boundaries other than no noting that, for example, if you just take the undulation instability itself, then the selected wave number depends on confinement in a non trivial way, geometric mean of this length and the. the period, hmm. okay, uh, and therefore that will modulate other properties, but directly looking at the effect of boundaries we've not looked at. In general, boundaries affect active matter an awful lot. Uh, the most extreme is this st uh, recent stuff by Yariv Kafri, Mehran Kardar, and others uh, on how disorder at a boundary can actually destroy phase separation in the bulk and so forth. So, there are, so there's an awful lot of problems where we don't completely know what's going on. Some of Roshan, Roshan, PhD work is on how an apparently sub-extensive number of active particles can completely change an extensive, the behavior of an extensive number of otherwise uninteresting particles. There's all kinds of oddball things going on there. Didn't have a chance to talk about it. We haven't written it up. We haven't, we don't have what I feel is a theory that I can stand behind. So even, even without boundaries, even if you just have a collection of particles, far less than an extensive number of active particles seem to be capable of affecting the bulk of a system. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I kind of do. We can talk more about that. Any questions? Let's thank Sri Ram again.